Welcome into Training Camp Live presented by Publix. Casey Phillips and Scott Smith here. And unfortunately, the team is inside today. Unfortunately for us. For us. Not Unf for them. Very fortunate for them. <laughs> unfortunate for us. At least, again, we do have our awesome quarterbacks out here getting some work in. That has saved us each of these days that they have had inside practice where we at least have something we can <laughs> still show you guys, which is awesome. We're going to get to your questions, as always, at the end of the show. So make sure you submit those over on YouTube or on Facebook. And we're also going to be talking about everything we learned from practice yesterday and looking ahead to what's going on this week and taking a little bit of a look at the special teams from kickers to return job to gunners to everyone else that could potentially be making the team thanks to special teams. So let's go ahead and dive on in, but let's start with our frontier play of the day from yesterday's practice. And Fuck. that was, uh, I think, the first of maybe a, a couple Dean interceptions. Finally, in yeah, finally some love for the defense. Yes, which I've they actually um, yelled at uh, <laughs> us in practice yesterday that they did not feel they had been represented enough in the play of the day. I've been saying that every day. Yes, and that they were after, you know, any time that a play like that would happen, they'd be like, you better make that the play of the it day. It might have been difficult to find a good offensive play yesterday. Let's just say they are not inside as a reward to the offense right. for what they did yesterday. <laughs> right, so yes, that is the, the perfect transition from why it was definitely a defensive play. Uh, Bru you know, I, what I love about Bruce Arians is uh, you never really wonder what he's thinking. <laughs> he is pretty straightforward with what he says, and he was not happy with the offense after practice yesterday. Yeah, the good thing about it when he does that, when he's very honest about one side stinking or the other, is that it makes you feel better about the days when he says, yeah, it was pretty good all around because you, you can figure he's, he's not sugarcoating it. He's yeah. telling the truth because you contrast it when if they do do badly, you find out about it. That's and a good point. I would say the offense got an earful yesterday. <laughs> I saw a Donovan Smith tweet about an hour later and it just looked so like glum, just like it was like, <laughs> These are the days you learn from, and it just it just had such a glum tone to it. It's yeah. like I've been uh, I've been chastised by mom and dad. Yes, and I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. I'm sitting in my room thinking about it now. Yeah. So uh, it was apparently they didn't match the energy. They didn't come out with much energy, uh, and that's tough when you're playing against this defense and they're they've got their energy level up where it usually is. You're just going to get swamped. Uh, you know, it was funny. Coach was basically saying they were maybe started to think they were they were too good. You know, they were reading their own press clippings after a very mm -hmm. good performance by the first team offense in the scrimmage. And uh, I think you'll probably we won't be able to see it because, like you said, they went inside. But I'm willing to bet you see a much more energetic offense today. I would agree with that. So what were some of the potential issues of what was going on with them? Why they did have, you know, pretty good scrimmage. And then I know we talked about the energy level, but was there anything kind of going on X's and O's wise or that, you know, without us giving away too much of, of what was kind of happening that seemed to be a problem? Well, they, uh, they, they're, the protection apparently wasn't very good, but coach said it wasn't just the O-line. 11 guys stunk at once, but, <laughs> and he also said the protection has not been a problem throughout camp. So don't read too much into one bad day. Right. Uh, otherwise I think it was just basically, you know, they, they it's, if you if your energy level isn't up, then you're probably not on your details. You're probably not crisp in your in your routes and so on. And and I think it was just all a matter of all of that together. Yeah, and I think it was interesting to get to see the way that Brady handled that. That um, you know he has been great about being a very sort of rah rah guy and praising guys when they do well and getting everybody fired up. And but you know on a day that they were struggling, he didn't you know let it slide. And he was definitely it wasn't just kind of like come on guys in general. He was going to individual guys and really coaching them up, essentially. You know, you forget how much of a coach on the field he can be, yeah. whether it was, you know, there's time for OJ that he kind of went over and said, no, this is how this route needs to go, like down to just such tiny little details with all these other people on the team. And I love that sense of accountability that he brings and that it's that he has both sides. So they're not feeling like he's just chastising them or anything because there are the days that he, when they do something right, he is the first yeah. to praise everybody and I just think that's such a perfect role of a quarterback in, in, in accountability for the whole team. That's definitely been the storyline all of camp and I guess it's not really very surprising. You would expect this guy to be a great leader. I don't think he would have gotten to where he got without right. being that um, but it's good to see it in action. That's true. Okay well let's take a look at what is ahead this week. It is crazy to us we are now officially less than two weeks to the first game which is so exciting and it's been weird because without preseason games and the normal way that camp has gone 
the the typical timing of certain things has, has felt off and to realize that there's a lot that has to happen this week yeah. to, to be ready for the regular yeah, season. Yeah, forget the, that we're 13 days away from the first game. We are five days away from the cut. And that's what has to be first and foremost on all these, or most of these players' minds right now. I'm sure there's some guys who are Yeah, I don't think Mike Evans is super yeah, worried, about worried about getting <laughs> cut. Uh, but there are a lot of guys that are that are on the bubble or still fighting for jobs or roster spots. Uh, and that has to be – this is the most unusual week of camp there's probably ever been. Usually you break camp somewhere around mid, mid – mid-August or on August 20th, maybe at the latest. You still have two preseason games to go after that. You're still practicing, but it's not training camp anymore. It's more like a regular season schedule. And you have one game on a Thursday night on that last week, and then the players are off on Friday, and the cuts start happening on Friday, but most of them happen on Saturday. This week, this year, they're practicing all the way up to the day before the roster cuts. And so on Friday, you have guys that will be competing for jobs. And that some decisions might not already be made. What they do on Friday could matter to what happens on Saturday. And that's crazy. That that's is crazy. And, and then, speaking of Friday, we found out that there will actually be another scrimmage yeah. happening. That we know that after the last one, Bruce had said that, you know, that they might not need another one. He wasn't sure yet, but they are going to have it. It will be closed, so there really won't be much in the way of media coverage of what goes on. Because training camp will officially kind of be over to where they let media be there for the entire time and right. all of that. But um, I, I have to wonder if it is related to what you said, that the realization that those cuts are needing to be made and those decisions are meeting, needing to be made and that, that maybe the coaches needed to see another more yeah. game-like atmosphere to know exactly who they want. I would suggest that it probably was not an easy decision. And when you go there and you see Ronald Jones get an injury that he escaped, he was practicing yesterday, and, and Carlton Davis, you see him get injured. He was okay, apparently it's not a big deal. But it does make you think a little bit more about the risks and rewards of this. And that may have been why immediately afterwards, Bruce was saying, I'm not sure if we're gonna have a second one of these, even though he originally said there were gonna be two. But I guess as you sit down and you think about it, it's what you said, Casey, they need some more full speed evidence and probably mostly on special teams. It's probably more of the same. And we saw him bring up three guys, that three rookies that helped themselves last time, Quentin Bell and Javon Hagen and Cam Gill. But that could just be a one-time thing. You want to see them do it several times. Mm -hmm. So if those guys have a shot, like if Quentin Bell helped himself to get the 50-second spot or something like that, then uh, they'd like to see him solidify it, right. just as an example. So. so, yeah, I know we talked about the, the cuts need to be made, and there's also going to be waivers and practice squad decisions as well coming up this week. Well, it's like they call the, they usually call it, we've had administrations here before call that Sunday the second draft hmm. because there are, the waiver wires flooded, as you can tell, with, you know, I, I know we're going to be able to keep 69 guys counting the practice squad, but immediately there are going to be 23 guys per team, roughly. Some guys go on, on injured list and so on, but roughly 23 guys per team and 32 teams. So we're talking over 600 people that are going to be on the waiver wire all at once. And often there's a guy that you've been keeping your eyes on. You're thinking there's a chance this team cuts him. And if they do, we like him. I'm just throwing, I'm making it up, but we like this guy as a better sixth cornerback than the guy we currently have sixth on our depth chart. And you make a couple changes at the bottom of your roster. And then, yeah, it's even more important this year, but you can start forming your practice squad after everybody clears waivers on Sunday. And, and uh, I, you know, I think teams will be rushing to make sure they get the guys they want. And they'll also be looking around because I, if you've got 16 practice squad spots, there's a pretty good chance that two, three, four, five of them will come from outside guys that you liked. Right, that's true. And real quick, just a reminder to people who, um, maybe don't remember the, the specific changes to the practice squad this year, how it's different than years past. Well, they were already going to expand it from 10 to 12. That was part of the new CBA, but they made a sort of a one-year decision to bump it all the way up to 16, which is uh, obviously an opportunity to allow you to keep more players around to deal with the potential losses if you get some kind of COVID impact. Right. Uh, in addition, six of those spots, which I think is four more than it used to be, you can you have exemptions, and you can have you can put a player of any uh, amount of service time on that practice squad. You used to not be able to do that. If once they got two years, you couldn't be on the practice squad. So literally, any player that you cut or another team cuts, if they're willing to do it, it could be a ten-year veteran. You could put them on the practice squad. So that's a big difference this year. Okay. And then also the last thing, each week you can bring two of those guys up. To, to pump your roster up to 55 for a game for the mm. weekend. And you can go to 48 active players if you wish, as long as one of them is an eighth offensive lineman. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out and affects things this season. Okay, well, we are going to take a quick break. And, of course, just a reminder, in our final segment, we're going to be taking your questions through YouTube and Facebook. So get those in now. And for now, let's meet that rookie, Tristan Wirfs.
very passionate guy. You know, I love, I love, I love you know, fans. I'm, I'm a big people person. Like walk, running off the field, like I love celebrating with them, pumping them up after a win and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm very passionate, you know, on and off the field. And the University of Iowa is very different than a lot of a lot of schools. Um, I think we're held to a pretty high standard, probably a higher standard than most. Win, graduate, and do it right. You know, that's kind of the University of Iowa's mantra. I was really big into baseball growing up. That was, I think, for a long time, my number one sport. And then in high school, track kind of came into the picture quite a bit, you know, shot putting discus. So I think there were a lot of times when I guess my number one sport changed, I would say, growing up. Yeah, I, I did as many as I could, but um, I think baseball would have definitely been, um, you know, that, that was a, that like a close a close race between football and baseball. It just makes you into a well-rounded athlete. Like, you get, you get so much different exposure, like, to, you know, different muscle groups like wrestling. I mean... You know, the first day of wrestling, you know, you come home, wake up next morning, and you're sore in places that you didn't think you could be sore. And I think just just that exposure to different things, you know, kind of creates a, a pretty a pretty well balanced athlete. My mom, her commitment just taught me just kind of to be accountable. Like, I don't know, we kind of had this thing in Iowa. It's like, you know, you're not gonna be able to do anything if you're not there. I think the commitment, you know, that she made, you know, being able to come to all my sport, let alone, you know, let me play all the sports, and then but making the commitment to still come to every event, you know, do her best to come to every, you know, every sporting event was, was incredible. You know, it meant the world to me. My biggest goal, make the biggest impact that I can. You know, I, I love being a part of a team. I, I, you know, I loved all my teammates at Iowa and I can't wait to get to meet you know, all the guys on the Bucks. So just, just make the biggest impact that I can, you know, in, in any way, shape or form. And, and you know, hopefully we have a lot of success on the field, but I think that'd be, that's my, that's my main, my main goal right now. As the national spotlight shines on Tampa Bay, a new reality is staring the Buccaneers in the face. During this time, it's important to establish a sense of normalcy, which brings Chris Godwin to a familiar place. You want a treat, buddy? Hey. Hey, you want a treat? There you go. Good job, buddy being able to kind of step away from everything that's going on, all the craziness in the world, all the change, you know, that we've had going in the last two weeks to come out here, take a deep breath, enjoy a little bit of the of the weather, um, walk some dogs, man, and just kind of get a little bit into like the routine of what we normally do. It's all part of a bigger mission for the Team Godwin Foundation to help raise awareness for the animals that currently live in shelters and to ultimately get them adopted into loving homes. This one's yours. <laughs> I never saw a third that big. That looked like uh, the emoji. People right now with the whole quarantine thing, people are like, oh my God, I have to stay in my house. Like, I can't do anything. It sucks, and it does. But then it's like, for a shelter dog, they're in a kennel that's a lot of times, how big do you think kennels are? Not eight big. feet, like, in the back, like, eight feet deep. Like, just, they just sit there. So it's like, if you have time, and you can, even if you... You know, if you can't adopt, you can foster. If you can't foster, you can volunteer. If you can't volunteer, you can donate. Me and Mariah, we've been together for eight years now. And, you know, she, she's my partner in crime, man. You know, like everything that we do, we just do it together. And that, I feel like that's so unique because and with as much time as we spend together, I feel like most people get tired of each other. And, you know, thankfully, we just have it. So we uh, recently just got engaged. <laughs> uh, it was, we were out in Cape Town, South Africa, um, and really just enjoying everything that, that they have to offer out there. It was really beautiful. I'm sure she'll remember it forever. <laughs> she loved mountains and stuff like that. So. And he was shaking as if he didn't know the answer. Oh, After yeah. nine years of spending every day together. He's <laughs> more nervous than anything else I've ever done. I mean, <laughs> use my hands for a living, but can't put a ring on. <laughs> Welcome back into Training Camp Live presented by Publix. Casey Phillips and Scott Smith here. And it is crazy to realize we have today and tomorrow. And then that is it for these Training Camp Live shows. It is crazy to believe that Training Camp is already coming to a close. Uh, unfortunately, that also means that the media availability will sort of be shrinking now that Training Camp, they, they let the media watch the entirety of practice. Once it's not considered Training Camp anymore, that goes down to where it's only the first 30 minutes, which will include the, the scrimmage 
on Friday that we, we told everybody that uh, earlier in the first segment, in case you missed it, the team will be having another scrimmage on Friday at Raymond James Stadium the way that they did last week. But this one will not be nearly as open to the media as the other one was. So there won't be quite as much coming out of it. But I think we'll probably kind of know a lot of what came out of it based on the cuts that happened the next yeah. day. If there yeah. are certain guys that all of a sudden are making it or not making it that we can see where maybe certain guys were helped by it a lot. And that could include the kickers. That could. That could definitely inc include the kickers and just special teams overall. We've heard so much from Coach this training camp about how important it is. And I mean, I think we've always known that. But for me personally, I just I have found it interesting how much he has emphasized it, that people well, would be talking about guys like Parnell Motley or guys that you know seem to be really impressing on the field in terms of their position play. And then he'd be like, yeah, but if you don't do the special teams thing, it, it doesn't matter that much. And he's, he's just really harped on that. So this segment, I figured we could talk about both the kickers and everything else in terms of special teams, guys that need it to make the roster, guys that have impressed with it so far, and just and what you've seen in terms of how this could end up shaking out based almost solely on special teams. Yeah, well, I think the reason he's been emphasizing it more this year is because he's been emphasizing how difficult it is with all the difficulties of, of the lost off season and the lost preseason in this compressed training camp, the part that's been most difficult is evaluating young players on special teams. And again, I think that's partially a big reason why they're doing the second scrimmage to see more of that. Uh, so that's why he's been talking about it a lot more than usual. And it underscores how difficult it is for these guys who we always talk about, hey, their best chance, this young player's best chance is to get a role in special teams first, and so he can be active on game day, and that eventually leads to opportunities to play offense or defense, which is obviously their eventual goal. And, um, yeah, it's tough this year. But uh, there's there's some still some things to be figured out, and unfortunately with 13 days to go before the first game, it appears that that includes the kicking competition, which is not where you want to be, obviously. No, no it is not. Um, and I know Matt Gay spoke to the media yesterday. Um, coach has been asked about the kicking situation since the scrimmage Friday. So what do you feel like you've learned from Matt, from Coach, and just overall where the kicking situation stands? Well, the good news for Matt is he uh, appears to not lost any confidence, and, and that's the first thing that, that goes for kickers. And look at this right here. Last year he was 5 of 8 on kicks beyond 50. He made a 58-yarder at one point. As you can see, he was one of the leaders in terms of most 50-yard field goals, but that kind of gets to the point. Coach says you can make that 55-yarder, but we need to make sure that when we get – all the way down to the 15 yard line, you're going to make the 33 yarder. And, you know, he had the, the missed kick against the Giants at the end was a 34 yarder. He missed two kicks inside the 30 and then um, inside the 30 range, 30 to 39, and then missed a, a handful of extra points, which are basically 33 yarders. And so to get more consistent on every kick, for, no matter where he's kicking from, Matt says, he kind of worked on his form a little bit over the offseason, looking to shorten it up and simplify it so there's. So it's easier to repeat exactly the same every single time, which makes a lot of sense for a kicker. And I personally thought his form was already pretty simple and direct, especially when you compare it to somebody like, we remember Roberto Aguayo seemed to have a very elaborate kicking thing, mm -hmm. and I, I felt like it was hard for him to repeat that every time. But right. um, that's one of the things that he's been working on. It made it, this offseason made it difficult for him because he didn't have as many opportunities to have a guy snap it and hold it for him. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's just getting more and more comfortable as camp goes along, because he's getting more opportunities to kick in a real situation with this new form. And I, I mean, he's pretty sure it's going to work out. But what he knows, as he made a point of, is this team has high expectations and kicking the kicker is going to be important. So that guy has to be good. Right. And I thought it was interesting to hear from Matt how important it was for him to get back into the stadium in a more game like atmosphere to kick. That that's a whole other benefit of these scrimmages sure. that I don't know that we had really emphasized beforehand. But getting them in there into that stadium, and he said even just the fact, I mean, to think about the fact that the last time he was in there in a game-like situation, he missed his last few kicks in that game, and it was really tough for yeah. him. And so much of kicking is mental. To just get in there and sort of reset it, to, to get rid of that, to get some new kicks in there. And, you know, we, we've heard so much about, oh, the south end zone, that that's where he's kind of had yeah. some of his issues. And yes, there are some things about, yeah, the wind might be a little bit different and more swirling. And mm -hmm. there's some aspects of the, the way the stadium is that can make that a little more challenging. But he talked about it. I, I liked this in his media availability where he said the idea of making it a benefit right. to us that you can be so used to that. If it is at all the stadium, yeah. it's your home stadium. You can get used to it. You can make it a benefit because the other team's going to have to kick on that end zone, too, potentially. And then even just that he said to, to get to that point where he feels good and confident again to get that kick in the stadium. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, he. we all knew that the, he had an, unus an unusually high percentage of his misses last year were not just at home, but kicking towards the south goalposts. 
but I did not realize, as he said, that's known around the league. Mm -hmm. Around the league, they know that that's a tougher place. You know, like there's a couple spots like in the Giants stadium. There's a couple spots that are known to be tougher, and apparently that that's not just us. Everybody knows that. So you're right; it could be a benefit. Right, which is which is going to be interesting. Okay, you mentioned a couple guys in that first segment that have helped themselves with special teams, but I wanted to hear overall who are who are all those different guys that either have already potentially helped themselves on special teams or would need to help themselves on special teams? Well, the thing that's important to remember is that Keith Armstrong said, and I think Bruce said something similar, that you're going to have to rely on veterans more this year. And if you look at this list, this is who led us in special teams tackles last year, and all of those guys are back. And, and an uh, th important thing to look at there is what position do they play? You know, you, you get a lot of your special teams guys from safeties and linebackers, but if you can be a wide receiver like Justin Watson or a running back like Dare who can make tackles or even a defensive lineman like Patrick O'Connor if you can play one of those positions and be a good cover guy that really helps you quite a bit so as you can see you can rely and that could be the very beginning of your core special teams right there what we're seeing on screen and there's probably not going to be a ton of spots for rookies but we talked about guys that are helping themselves like Quentin Bell those are guys like Quentin Bell and Cousin Daniels they're outside linebackers which means they're probably about 6'3", 240 pounds, and they're fast. And that's a good makeup for a special teams guy, uh, both in sort of in terms of like coverage from the inside slots, but also on kickoff returns. Some of the, I don't, you know, they've got terms for them. Like one of them's apparently called guard, which I never knew on kickoff return. Like Kevin Minter plays guard, Keith Armstrong said the other day. So it can be good to be and amazingly, sort Amazingly, of, you didn't assume he meant offensive guard yeah, I mean, on, it, the, on the I line. He didn't quite have that build. It's called a guard, so. <laughs> Uh, I think they'll be relying on veterans a lot, uh, and I think there's a decent core of them there. But, y you know, those you would like to find a few young guys who can help you on special teams and therefore be active on game day and maybe find out a little bit what else they can do. And how about the return game? I know that that got very much shaken up when TJ Logan went down earlier. Um, who would you say are the front runners for the kick return job, the punt return job, and, and are they going to be guys that that could potentially be why they make the roster? Yeah, I think Jaden Mickens is the obvious guy, and, and that could inform how the roster breaks down in a couple ways. If if they have five receivers they want to keep, like I think we can pretty safely say the top two guys, Scotty Miller and Justin Watson, mm -hmm. if they want to keep a – and then Tyler Johnson's your fifth-round rookie. Even though he's not really contributing right now, you probably want to keep him around. That's a pretty easy five to predict right there. So if you want to keep a six receiver because he returns kickoffs in Jaden Mickens, then you might not keep a four, fifth running back or a sixth cornerback or something like that. So that informs a lot of different decisions. So even though Jaden Mickens could be the front runner, the decision could be made at some point. Let's use somebody we already were going to keep for other reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dari or Keyshawn Vaughn or or um, Ray Calais for kicks if he makes the team, and uh, you know maybe Antoine Winfield or Justin Watson for punts. So it's it's really going to come down to the wire here, I think. And you know now that some of the rules with kickoffs have changed, where you you tend to have a lot more touchbacks, has that changed the importance yeah. of those rules? Hundred yeah. percent. Yes. Yeah. Your so, kickoff returner isn't that important of a position anymore. I mean, we all saw it. There were there were games where all that T.J. Logan did during the game was stand with his feet on the goal line and wave his arms yeah. three or four times a game. Which but, I still think I could do this job. You know, <laughs> I'm still if you can guarantee throwing they my kick hat it over in the ring. <laughs> yes, if I can guarantee they're going to kick it which over my you, head, I feel confident I can do it. Which you this. almost could do if you face the Buccaneers. Last year, Bradley Pinion set a record for most kickoff touchback percent, uh, most kickoff touchbacks. Just this year, number is 88 or 89, which also says a lot about how many touchdowns we were scoring last right. year. Uh, as you can see, he was also second in the league. I did not realize Joey Sly had such a good season kicking for yeah, the that's Panthers. that's incredible. He also was on that list of most 50-yard uh, uh, field goals. So even though he was in the, not in the high range, he was around 78% on his field goals, which isn't awesome. He, he apparently made a good impact in a couple different ways for the Panthers, which is unfortunate to see. But as you can see there, uh, after those two guys, there's a big drop-off until third place. And, uh, and that Bradley Pinion, if you're a coach that wants to just do a kickoff, and take away the risk of anything bad happening. You want to touch back on every kickoff if you can, then Bradley Pinion's a great weapon. And so uh, I, I, that's one question we don't have to answer on special teams this week. Who's okay. going to be the punter? Yes, that is a good point. Yeah, he's been having a great camp. Okay, well, we have one more segment coming up. We're going to get to your Twitter or your Facebook and your YouTube questions. Sorry, Facebook and YouTube is where we're going to be pulling those from. So make sure you send those in right now during this break. We're going to come back in just a few minutes. But for now, take a look at those shots of the day.
Welcome back into Training Camp Live presented by Publix. This is our final segment of the day, which means it's getting to your Facebook and YouTube questions. And again, tomorrow is our last one of these shows. So if you have any questions for us today or tomorrow, these are your last chances to get those in for Training Camp Live. Uh, I wanted to see this first one. This is interesting. Uh, we had a question asking who's been the surprise of camp? Well, early on, it was Parnell Motley. Unfortunately, he's hurt right now. And uh, coach said yesterday he may not make it back onto the field this week. Uh, that's that's unfortunate for him because he had such momentum going. Although you could tell when a coach reaches his uh, t his final point, his tipping point on, on hearing about a young player too much and everybody raving about him, because that's when he comes back with something like, everybody's like making this guy into an all pro already. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let's not diminish the fact he was making a lot of plays. Yes. Um, surprise. Other than that, I I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, Justin Watson, I think both of us have been pleasantly surprised at, at how much he really is in the mix here for the third receiver job because really he spent two years not getting much of a chance at all to catch the ball until the last four games of last year. And so um, you kind of figured that maybe that's what he was. He was just that depth spot who could play linebacker, I mean play special teams, but comes back in with a little trim down. He wasn't in bad shape. He just decided to lose a few pounds because he thought it would make him faster and it did. And, and he's been out there a lot. So I think the amount that we've uh, seen and heard from Justin Watson is a little bit of a surprise and okay. a, a really nice one. And then maybe uh, Nacho, Raheem okay. Nunez yeah. Rochas. Uh, it looks like they have in, uh, in plans for him a bigger role and, and uh, he's really taken advantage of it. Okay, and uh, Daniel had asked, uh, how far behind is the offense or the defense from each other? You know, does anybody seem to be kind of ahead? No, I don't think so. And, of course, that's what you want. Yesterday, obviously, the offense was way, way behind. But if you take the scrimmage as an example, we were raving about the, the first-team offense and Tom Brady, and they deserved it. They were great, but they were playing the second-team defense. Meanwhile, our first-team defense wasn't letting Blaine Gabbard and his crew do much at all. There, I think there were a couple times where they got first downs, as Coach said, but then they just shut them down from mm -hmm. there. They, they didn't get anywhere near scoring the, the second-team offense against our defense. So I, I think they're both about where they need to be uh, with the games coming up so close. Um, okay, and Francisco asked, do you see any decline in Brady – uh, and he mentioned things about, you know, like his throwing arm and stuff. Has yeah. there been any sign of that? No, and, and uh, that's the good thing. And I, and I think that's what uh, Bruce Arians and Jason Light were saying when they back when they first signed him. That, the, you know, it's not like they're just signing this guy because his name is Tom Brady and he's won six Super Bowls. There wouldn't be much point in paying $50 million just to have a name on your team. Uh, they, they saw what he did, what he's been doing the last few years, and, and knows he can still do everything mm -hmm. he's always done. And then in this camp... You know, one guy that gets to run a lot of deep routes is Scotty Miller, and uh, he says he's loving the way Tom Brady throws. He says he throws a fantastic right. deep ball. They're perfect spirals. They, he says, I, I'm not exactly sure what he means by it, but he says it, they, just, they go straight up and they come straight down right to you. So I guess that means they're not wobbly. Mm -hmm. The trajectory is, is absolutely perfect to keep you running in stride as you catch the ball, or they're easy to see or something. Right. But um, according to the guy who gets to run a lot of deep routes, there's nothing wrong with Tom Brady's arm on deep balls. So that's okay. obviously good. Um, Joey asked how many tight ends will be on the official roster, and he asked about uh, Cody McElroy in particular. Yeah, that's a great that's a great pull right there, Cody McElroy, because we tend to talk about Tanner Hudson as that guy that we know has a lot of talent, can play tight end in the NFL, but faces such a logjam of great players ahead of him. But that's the same thing for Cody McElroy. I mean, this is a really athletic, talented guy. I don't know if his blocking is NFL caliber level. That's probably the thing that he would need to prove the most, but he's like a big receiver out there. He's very talented and big and fast and strong. And, and for all those reasons, he would probably be a pretty good special teams player as well. Uh, but there's just so many numbers. And we talked about, you, if you keep a sixth receiver, one of them to return kicks, can you possibly keep more than four tight ends? And y you know you're keeping, I assume, Gronkowski, O.J. Howard, and Cam Brate. And Anthony O'Claire, not only is he your designated blocking guy in, in 12 packages when you want to run the ball, but everybody's raving about him making one-handed catches out here and, yeah. and saying he just really hasn't had the opportunity. Right. I don't see him still getting a lot of opportunities to catch right. the ball with all those other tight ends, but if he's your fourth tight end, can you keep a fifth? Yeah. So he, he asked on the official roster, I would suspect four, but I wouldn't be surprised if they find a way, practice squad, I guess, yeah. to keep around at least one of those other right. two guys, if not both of them. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see. Uh, Andrew asked, do you think there will be any more free agent moves before the first game? Well, uh, you know, there usually is something. Um, there's usually a couple moves in that Saturday, Sunday of this weekend range when everybody's making all their cuts. And like I was saying earlier in this show, uh, you know, you like this guy better than your 53rd player. So if the Jets cut him, 
you're keeping an eye on it and, and you put in a waiver claim. Uh, will there be, but I think he's talking about a free agent signing like LaShawn McCoy that we made right before camp or um, uh, AQ Shipley last week. Uh, I don't, I don't w never want to say never, um, but because uh, I was, I was one of the people who was saying I didn't think we'd had a running back and then we did. Uh, so I don't ever want to say never, but we don't have a lot of cap space right now and I'm not sure. You know, if you're talking about maybe like a veteran outside linebacker, do we have the space to add one of those guys? Because that seems like the spot where you might want to do it. Uh, I would think you would have done that already because right. they're sitting out there and you know what you've got. So unless we get to the end of this week and decide, I'm sorry, none of these guys, Quentin Bell, Cousin Daniels or whatever, do we feel comfortable with in that fourth spot, then maybe. But I, I would bet against it. Okay. And uh, Greg asked, at this point, what does the running back depth chart look like in your mind? In my mind, it's Ronald Jones. He's the guy. He's going to uh, be obviously get the lion's share of the carries. And I think the guy that's going to, at the start of the season at least, that's going to be the main guy that's, that um, gives him a break is LaShawn McCoy. I just don't think Keyshawn Vaughn has had the opportunity yet to prove himself that he, he, can, he can do that at the start of the season. And Coach basically said that last week when asked, would Keyshawn Vaughn have a role on, in week one? And he, he said, well, maybe as a kick returner. I mean, that tells me not really planning on him being heavily involved in the early going. Uh, and then the third guy that would probably be in that mix would be Dare. We know what he can do on third downs, uh, and uh, he's good in pass protection and all that. So to me, those are the three guys that you're using in the early going. Then maybe Keyshawn Vaughn uh, gets more involved as the season goes along. And maybe if he makes a 53-man roster, Ray Calais uh, gets some little packages for himself on offense. Right. Okay, well, that is going to do it for us on this edition of Training Camp Live presented by Publix. Thanks so much to all of you guys for being with us. Thanks for all those amazing questions. And, again, tomorrow morning is our final one of these. So make sure you are here tomorrow morning, 830, with those questions ready to go. We'll see you then.